Firstly, I'd like to say a big thank you to Vladimir Duliana and the other, other organisers. I know that many people have lost a lot of sleep uh, lately uh, to make this conference possible for all of us and I'm grateful to that and thank you also for inviting me here. I'm originally from Australia. I haven't come quite all that way. I'm now in the United Kingdom, but my story does start here, actually. Um, I come from Perth in the southwest corner of Western Australia, which is um, one of the world's most beautiful cities. We have lovely blue skies, uh, some of the best beaches in the world, beautiful university. Um, we had um, <coughs> rabbits would hop across the grass early in the morning. Uh, down behind the veterinary school in the forest. We had kangaroos hopping around the forest. It was a lovely university. But unfortunately, um, it had a bit of a dark secret. Um, a lot of harmful animal use was occurring uh, within the veterinary curriculum. I entered the veterinary cu uh, course as a student around about 20 plus years ago, of course, not to be involved in harmful animal usage. I had the vague um, understanding that harmful animal usage was probably part of the curriculum and also the vague understanding that humane teaching methods were probably available, but I was unaware of what the details of either of those might be. And I rationalised to myself that if I was required to harm animals during my training, it would be worth it because I'd be able to help so many more animals after I graduated as a veterinarian. And thus unprepared, um, I entered first year of the veterinary course. And in first year, we dissected uh, a variety of animals in the introductory biology classes. We dissected uh, worms, snails, um, body parts from abattoirs. For reasons that were never made clear to us, there seemed to be a strange obsession with dissecting lampreys. So we dissected a lot of lampreys, and I still don't really know why that was. <clears throat> and I carried along um, not thinking too much about where all these animals were coming from and this strategy of not thinking worked quite well for me up until the end of first year, unfortunately. And at the end of first year, there was a laboratory class that was different. And in this laboratory class, the animals were not, um, the body parts were not coming to us on dissecting trays pinned out on wax or covered in plastic looking a little bit like meat that you might get in a supermarket in some respects. This class was different because in this class we had the rats were still alive and they were living, breathing and running around, they were still alive. And they were being killed just prior to the start of the uh, dissection by the demonstrators and then we students had to dissect out the intestinal tracts and the cells were still alive. And we had to lower those into different solutions to measure the uptake of glucose from uh, the different solutions in order to demonstrate some kind of scientific principle that had been well established for decades and well described in videos and books. Even though I didn't know the details of what the alternatives might be, I was sure that they must exist and so I went to the instructors um, on the morning of the lab class and said, I don't want to be involved in killing these rats, uh, I request an alternative. But this time of course I was poorly prepared, I only went to the demonstrators on the uh, morning of the class and I didn't know the details of what the alternatives might be. They didn't have any time to prepare an alternative for me and they denied my request. With the result that I then boycotted the class, I refused to participate in the laboratory class. With the result that I then failed um, the, the, the class, but I passed the course overall. This stirred up a great deal of controversy because nobody had boycotted anything for many years and some students and some faculty supported what I did, others were opposed and there was much discussion. All of this controversy uh, caused the laboratory to be stopped completely the following year. So I lost a grade but I also, this, this saved the lives of about 40 rats every year after that so I thought it was well worth uh, losing a grade over and I was very happy about that. At one point, I was called into the offices of the course directors <clears throat> and they told me this. They said that what I had seen so far was only the tip of the iceberg compared to what I would have to do to animals later in the veterinary course and perhaps I should reconsider my choice of career. Well, they were right. Unfortunately, it was only the tip of the iceberg. And I'm going to show you now some pictures of what happened next in the veterinary course. And I'm going to start with anatomy in second year of the five-year veterinary degree in Western Australia. 
So I'm going to show some pictures of dissected animals, which are not very nice, so if you don't want to see those, uh, look away now. So we moved on into uh, second year, and in anatomy we were given primarily greyhounds, and these were greyhounds that were not racing fast enough anymore to be profitable at the greyhound racing track. And they're often given to veterinary schools uh, to serve as uh, blood donors, um, but also for use in anatomy dissection. And a student group would receive one greyhound and every week you'd have a dissection laboratory and you'd dissect a different part. And it might be a front leg or a hind leg or a chest cavity or an abdominal cavity or some other part of the greyhound. And in between the greyhounds would go into the freezer. So over the semester you would dissect the greyhounds piece by piece and these are all the photos that I took when I was a student. <clears throat> There were other dissection projects for our assignments. We would need to do things uh, such as dissect um, the cat in the top left, the horse's head, uh, farmed animals you can see along the bottom and so on. So that was anatomy. Uh, in physiology, um, I don't have any pictures actually because um, physiology was even worse. In this case, the animals were not dead and being dissected. They were still alive. And we used um, cane toads and other animals, but most commonly sheep. Australia is full of sheep. So students would um, read through uh, an instruction guide on how to anaesthetise a sheep. And often the instruction guides were not particularly well written. The students had never done this before. A student group would have to anaesthetise a sheep. And there might be ten groups in a classroom with maybe one or two uh, instructors across the classroom. So the students had never done this before. Their instructions were not very good and they were extremely stressed trying to successfully anaesthetise the sheep and then keep their first patients alive under anaesthesia, which was a bit difficult because they weren't very well supervised. This low level of supervision, unfortunately, is normal in veterinary courses, in my experience, and it's, it's a, a um, factor of uh, lack of uh, funding of universities and hence lack of staffing. Having hopefully successfully managed to stabilise their sheep under anaesthesia, the students would then have to inject the sheep with various drugs to demonstrate physiological effects, such as effects on heart rate and blood pressure. There was an experiment where students would have to cut into the sheep and sever the vagal nerve leading to the heart to see what this would do to the uh, heart rate. And students would have to intubate the sheep, pass a tube down into the airway to connect the sheep to a gas machine to force the sheep to breathe different types of gas to see what this would do to respiration. In one of the procedures, the uh, students had to cut off the air supply entirely to see what this would do as well. And at the end of all of this, if the sheep were still alive, the students would then have to kill the sheep before uh, recovering from anaesthesia. Now, I refused to participate in any of these experiments when I was a student. <clears throat> and I went to the demonstrator and I said, you know, can I have uh, an alternative to these laboratories? In this case, unfortunately, the instructor was very strongly opposed to the idea of humane teaching methods. She was a very committed animal researcher in her own research and she didn't want any introduction of uh, humane alternatives. I suppose she was afraid that it might lead to uh, the wider introduction of alternatives and start to change how she was required to do her own research, which was highly invasive experiments on animals. So my request was denied for the use of alternatives, so I didn't participate in any of these laboratory classes and I was failing physiology, of course. So after exhausting all avenues within the university, I went above her to the department head, to the dean, and so on. I went outside the university and I started to take legal action against the university. In Western Australia, as in many countries, there is anti-discrimination legislation. You cannot discriminate against people in the workplace or in their education on the basis of their religious beliefs or other conscientiously held beliefs. And I made the argument that my beliefs were conscientiously held beliefs against unnecessarily harming and killing animals for my education. And the state authority responsible for the anti-discrimination legislation uh, decided to take the case on. The other thing that I did was I went to the mass media and I had pretty soon um, 
very prominent television stories and newspaper stories about the harmful animal use that was going on inside the veterinary curriculum. And it's a very damaging story for a university when veterinary students are being uh, required to harm and kill animals in a very serious way in order to graduate when they can clearly show that alternatives are being used at other universities elsewhere. And there is good evidence to show that students using alternatives learn very well, and I'll talk about some of that later on. So the university was looking very bad, and these two factors um, very quickly resulted in the university setting up an, a committee to examine this whole issue of student conscientious objection to harmful animal use. And the result of that, this had gone above the veterinary school. This was now the academic council of the entire university and they had brought in an independent academic from another university to be the chair. The veterinary school didn't want any alternatives, but the university overruled them. They established a policy um, recognising that students come from a diversity of different cultures, religious beliefs and backgrounds and it was consistent with university values to respect students coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. And they agreed to make reasonable efforts to try to accommodate uh, students by providing alternatives of comparable difficulty for those students. So this was the first time that a formal policy had been passed in uh, an Australian university allowing conscientious objection by students. It then spread to other universities within Australia and also overseas within the US. <coughs> So that was, a lot happened actually in second year and after, another thing that happened I should say was with respect to the physiology laboratories, firstly I got all my marks returned to me so that was great. Secondly, I looked at the nine uh, laboratory classes in which these sheep were being really um, seriously harmed and killed and other animals sometimes. And I went to the Interniche book which is called From Guinea Pig to Computer Mouse. Nick, could you hold that up so everyone can see that book? I used this book, thank you Nick, along with um, one of the databases and I went through that and just over two days I was able to find that all of the laboratories in my course were common laboratory classes that physiology courses around the world have been using and so there have been alternatives developed for these specific laboratories and as described in that book that has more than 500 alternatives in lots of different uh, disciplines available and the databases have even more. So very quickly, in just two days, I came up with 163 alternatives for these nine laboratory classes. And I took them to the university's ethics committee and I said, I'm just a student, but I've been able to find all these alternatives. The faculty member in charge of all of this has obviously not done a proper search for alternatives and these experiments should not have been approved for teaching. Now they knew that the television stations and everybody was watching the university, so they panicked. So they thought, oh, we, we're in big trouble here. We will immediately stop all of those laboratories, which is what they did. So they were all stopped and they had to be uh, replaced with humane teaching methods as well. So that was my second year. It was quite busy. Third year was pretty quiet. Nothing happened, which was kind of nice after all of that. And then fourth year came. And in fourth year was surgical year. Fourth year of the five-year veterinary course. <coughs> So the standard way to learn veterinary surgery in my university, as was common at other Australian universities across the US and indeed most parts of the world actually, although strangely and to its credit not the United Kingdom where for decades humane teaching methods have been used instead. So, so long ago this was changed that nobody can really remember when it happened. But in most other countries the standard was that students would learn surgical procedures by anaesthetising healthy animals practicing the surgery on healthy animals and then uh, killing the animals at the end of the procedure before they recover consciousness. So um, the standard, standard was that students would be in groups of three. Uh, one student would be the surgeon, one would be the assistant surgeon, one would be the anaesthetist and every week you would rotate. And in our case we tended to do surgery on uh, these healthy young pigs and you can see that some of my classmates on the left and the, you can see what happened to the pigs afterwards there in the, uh, the bins in the um, pathology area waiting for cremation. So we went to the, myself and one other student who had joined me at that time, went to the instructors in charge of surgery and we said, 
we don't want to participate in all of this animal killing. Can we have an alternative, please? And this time they said, well, you have forced the whole university to, to you know, allow alternatives, but we don't agree with anything that you stand for. Um, we have to allow you to do this, but we're not going to help you at all. So you're going to have to organise your own surgical training and you're still going to have to come here uh, to all our surgical labs as observers. So that was actually worked out really well. We did set up our, our own alternative surgical course and I'll tell you a bit, a bit about that later on. But we also attended all of the standard surgical labs as well so we could see what they were like too. So it was a good opportunity to compare the two actually. Which is how I got these photos. <coughs> So, coming back to the end of the first year, the instructors were right, it was only the tip of the iceberg compared to what would later be asked of us in the veterinary course. They didn't succeed in making me reconsider my choice of career, but they did motivate me in another way. They motivated me to go away and really find out about what were the alternatives, what were the courses around the world where they were being successfully used, and what was the educational evidence about the effectiveness or otherwise of these alternatives. So that next time I was in a one and a half hour discussion with the academics in charge of a course when they were trying to change my views, I would know the, the details of these issues and I'd be able to uh, discuss the case effectively. So they motivated me in that way. So I'm going to share now some of what I learned about what the alternatives are for use in veterinary courses and other university courses as well. There are in these sorts of different categories really. There are high quality videos and computer simulations of both animal dissections and animal experiments. Ethically sourced cadavers are bodies that are obtained from animals that have died naturally or in accidents or been euthanised for genuine medical reasons or occasionally severe and intractable behavioural reasons. And they're a bit like um, human body donation programs for medical uh, students. Uh, well, we have the same thing for veterinary students. Uh, body parts from animals that hopefully have been ethically sourced can then be preserved in a variety of different ways, allowing them to be reused year after year, and I'll show you some of those. Non-invasive self-experimentation upon oneself and one's classmates to demonstrate physiological concepts as well, putting people on exercise bikes, looking at effects on things like heart rate and respiration, doing various harmless experiments. Clinical and surgical skills models and simulators and supervised clinical and surgical experiences as well with real patients that actually benefit from the procedures, similar to the training of, of human medical students actually. So I'm going to show you some pictures of these various alternatives and we'll look at some of the features of them. There are, um, as I say, a great many alternatives that have been developed now for the classical standard laboratory classes that exist in pre-clinical areas such as physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology, even anatomy. Uh, these are some of the alternatives uh, that, that are out there for dissections. They tend to show high quality um, photographs and videos of um, the actual animal parts. When we were students going into our dissection classes in anatomy, we were novices, we were beginners. And so when there were fragile organs such as in the abdomen of a rat, what normally happens is that students go in there and you can't see things very well. That's covered actually by fat and by skin and by subcutaneous tissue. You're groping around in there with your forceps and your scalpel and what actually happens, and there's three or four of you trying to get access, what actually happens is that you actually cut and mash up the organs and you destroy them pretty quickly. Once that's done, unfortunately you can't put them back together. And then you can't actually see some of those organs. You can't actually see what the anatomical structures are that you're supposed to be learning about. And that's it. You only had one rat. So it's actually better to have a prosection, a professionally performed dissection, which has been performed by experts, photographed and put in a simulation so you can clearly see what the structures are. You learn much more. The simulations have the ability to put up the microscopic or histologic uh, slides next to the macroscopic or gross anatomy so you can see how the cell structures and, and um, anatomy varies across the different parts of the body, the lining of the intestines versus the skin versus the muscle, brain cells and so on. This is not something you can do in a dissection classroom where you've got a chunk of meat in front of you so this is another useful feature of the alternatives. 
Some of these alternatives can be avail made available online. This one used to be uh, available for free, it is now available for a fairly small fee. It's produced by Colorado Veterinary School, which is one of the best veterinary schools in the world. And in this case, students look at different parts of the dog, which is the, st the species which is most studied by veterinary students. You can look at uh, different parts of the dog. You can look, for example, at the head. Uh, you can use to examine the bony anatomy, the soft tissue anatomy, the radiographic anatomy or the clinical anatomy. If you look, for example, at the uh, soft tissue anatomy, you can choose to look at different parts of the head. You can uh, click on certain muscles and you'll um, learn the standard anatomical information about the muscle, what is the point on the bone, where it originates, where it inserts, which is the main nerves that supply it and what is the function of the muscle. Those are the things that veterinary students need to learn for all of the major muscles. You can zoom in for a closer look. You can drag your mouse button across the screen, grab, grab a slider and watch the thing smoothly rotate to see it from different angles. You can look at the radiographic anatomy. This picture is showing uh, one of the uh, frontal sinus areas in the uh, bones of the skull. These are sorts of areas that could potentially become infected. You can look at clinical anatomy. This one's showing the location of some of the veins underneath the tongue. And you can look at anatomically important structures such as the glottis, the epiglottis. You need to know where the entrance to the airway is so that you can successfully pass the endotracheal tube for connecting the dog to an anaesthetic gas machine. You can do the same kind of thing for uh, human beings, for medical students as well. Roy Schneider was a medical illustrator at the University of Ohio, one of the uh, leading uh, medical schools in the US. And he uh, developed this simulation uh, enabling students to drag a slider button across the screen and to dissolve all the tissues away from the skin all the way down to the bone on a human head. And then dragging the button in the other direction, it'll all come back again. This, of course, is not something you can do with an actual dissection on a table in front of you. You can do this as many times as you want, clearly. This has the ability to uh, select certain muscles, such as the one in red next to the nose there. If you, the student clicks upon the muscle, the muscle will contract. And you'll see what the muscle does. In this case, it causes the nose to twitch. So you get to see what the, the function is of some of the important muscles uh, in the dissection. And again, this is an advantage compared to a conventional, traditional dissection. If you have a human head sitting in front of you on the table and the nose starts to twitch, then you need to seriously think about whatever it was you were eating and drinking last night, I would suggest. Um, this is an example of a dissection simulation for high school students, Digital Frog 2. It has different parts um, of it. There is uh, the dissection part, there is um, in, in which students have to, firstly, in the top left you can see um, a part where they will have to select their virtual instruments from a virtual toolkit and if they successfully drag the scalpel, the virtual scalpel blade across the correct parts of the frog, then a video will run showing what the actual dissection would look like on a real frog. Down in the bottom left you can see uh, functional diagrams. You'll actually get to see the, um, the venous and the arterial blood circulating through the correct chambers of the heart. Students can click on a button and see it all moving. Again, not something you can get by just dissecting a frog normally. And you can even learn something about the natural history of the frog. You can even click on the button and hear uh, what the frog sounds like in the wild. And previously I've tried to demonstrate this on stage for people, but it's never gone well, so I'm not going to try to do that for you. Um, <clears throat> another alternative, of course, apart from computer simulations, is actual body parts, which have been permanently preserved. Hopefully these will have been sourced from ethically sourced cadavers, from animals that have died naturally or in accidents or been euthanized for medical reasons. They can be preserved in a variety of different ways. And most veterinary schools have got anatomy museums which are full of preserved body parts. This was me as a student uh, in our anatomy museum with a horse's head in sections. And you can take these body parts and you, you put them in pots, so they're called potted specimens along with formaldehyde or other very strong chemical preservatives. 
which are designed to prevent uh, dissolving of the tissues, colonisation by bacteria or moulds, and to preserve the colours of the tissues as well. Uh, in the upper right, you can see uh, a cast of the blood vessels and other main structures in the kidney of a cow. And what happens here is that there can be uh, colour dyes that are perfused into major organs or even into airways of animals that are under deep anaesthesia prior to being killed. And then the soft tissues are dissolved away with mild acid solutions over prolonged periods of time, which leave these coloured casts of airways or blood vessels. In the bottom, that's a plastinated squid. Uh, it's possible to get body parts or, or entire uh, bodies of animals and to replace the water and the fats with uh, polymers, plastic parts, which gives them a plasticky texture, a very faint smell and permanently preserves them. So the benefit of these permanent preservation methods, of course, is you need to source the animal just once in the beginning and then you've got it hopefully forever compared to a traditional anatomy dissection lab where you're having to source uh, animals year after year after year and kill them every time. Okay, um, Tufts University is one of the world's leading uh, veterinary colleges and they were the first one in the US to set up an ethically sourced cadaver program. These now exist at many US veterinary colleges and also uh, our veterinary school in Australia where we set one up and many others around the world. Um, Tufts is a big veterinary school, but they're able to source all of their anatomy dissection needs and their clinical and surgical skills training needs from ethically sourced cadavers. They have a pet body donation program through their teaching hospital and they get sufficient uh, cadavers of animals being donated for teaching. Um, these next couple of slides are images from Tufts. This is from uh, their anatomy collection. These are the blood vessels of the liver and the gallbladder of a dog from an ethically sourced cadaver. These are the airways of a dog, also from another ethically sourced cadaver. So, of course, no animals being killed just for teaching purposes in this case, all ethically sourced. This is Gunther von Hagen. He's the anatomist who developed the plastination technique. And he has uh, travelling exhibitions uh, that travel around the world of plastinated animals. I think there were four exhibitions of animals and one travelling exhibition of plastinated humans as well. And one of the most exciting things I, I saw when I was at London's Natural History Museum uh, looking at his wonderful exhibition of plastinated animals was the big plaque at the front entrance that said none of these animals have been killed for the purposes of this exhibition. They've all been ethically sourced. So that was good. Secondarily, uh, there he is clearly demonstrating that even the largest of animals uh, can be successfully plastinated. If you ever get the chance to see one of these and you haven't already, they're actually fascinating. You won't need to worry about the animals being killed for them. They haven't been, but you'll get to see uh, all of the muscles and some of the other structures and there's informational uh, displays telling you what all the different body parts do. It's a really interesting, actually, way to learn about anatomy. Very, very fascinating. Ethically sourced cadavers can be used before uh, or without being permanently preserved as well. Um, in Australia, when I was a student, there were four veterinary schools. There's now about uh, seven, actually. Um, we had students go through all of the Australian veterinary schools and successfully graduate without harming animals in their training by 2005. This was one of the first at the University of Queensland, colleague of mine, Dr Briani Dixon. What she's doing there is she's using an ethically sourced cadaver um, donated through the uh, veterinary teaching hospital to practice placing a chest tube. Um, when dogs are in traffic accidents, they may have uh, ruptured diaphragms uh, resulting in air coming into the chest cavity or they may be bleeding into the chest cavity. Both of these can result in the lungs collapsing, making it hard to inflate the lungs and hard to believe. It's really important to insert a chest tube uh, in through the chest wall to draw out the blood or draw out the air to allow the lungs to reinflate. So it's a life-saving procedure and she's practicing this procedure on an ethically sourced cadaver. After being such a student, she successfully went to London um, and practised as a veterinarian uh, for many years and still is doing so today. 
Computer simulations are available not just for dissections but also for uh, animal experiments. And the early simulations were rightly criticised as being too simplistic and not realistic enough. Fair enough. More recent simulations will uh, require um, people to conduct virtual experiments on animals. And they'll see video clips of the results on real animals occurring. And you know it may not have been ethical to do that to those animals in the first place. But now that the video clips exist, they are able to be used forever in these simulations. Students may have to select um, things like um, and one of the very common experiments in physiology, something we had to do, I, I boycotted this, but was to um, dissect out the hind leg muscles from a frog leg and put them across a series of electrodes and apply electric currents. Uh, you'll see the nerve supply cause its effects uh, on the muscles of the uh, leg. The uh, leg muscle will contract. You have to, so in this case, you can do the whole thing virtually. You can set up a virtual bent top with a virtual oscilloscope to see what the uh, nerve, um, uh, nerve um, supply is, the, the electrical current running down the nerve, see what the effects would be on the virtual muscle and so on. So you can do the whole thing virtually. There are plenty more models that have been developed, uh, including for high school biology teaching. There are um, exhibitions such as this one and big ones in the US where these have been demonstrated. Models for teaching clinical uh, skills, such as how to take blood samples for laboratory technicians from uh, the um, tail veins of rats, which is the main location that blood is sourced from in rats, for example. This is Critical Care Jerry, one of the mannequins um, that have been developed for teaching um, clinical and diagnostic skills to veterinary students in particular. You can practice mouth to snout retussitation. Of course, everybody can do that. You don't need to be a vet, but. Uh, it's good for vets to know this. Along with palpation for ephemeral pulse down the hind leg, taking uh, blood samples from the, the arm veins with fake blood solutions, practicing uh, placing the endotracheal tube down into the airway for connection to an anaesthetic gas machine, listening to the heart and to the uh, lungs for normal and also abnormal heart sounds and breath sounds and you can program these to have up to about 20 different pathological different pathological sounds and require students to diagnose what it is that they're listening to. This is uh, Brioni Dixon practicing uh, CPR on um, critical care Jerry and when I was a student um, the standard way that this would be taught certainly at the University of Sydney where I had other colleagues doing this kind of thing as well was that cardiac arrest would be induced in real dogs and then students would have to practice to see if they could manage to resuscitate the real dogs. And uh, my colleagues at the University of Sydney got rid of that um, and we have succeeded in removing that kind of procedure from uh, veterinary training across the Australian veterinary schools. And you can learn the same kind of skills with uh, mannequins, which is um, the ethical way to do it. And of course, you can program more advanced versions with different scenarios as well, different con concurrent illnesses and complications that may arise that require the students to respond in real time. Haptic simulators are simulators that um, apply pressure to a student's fingertips which is anatomically appropriate depending upon where they are inside a simulation. What's going on here is that um, Brioni is now at the Royal Veterinary College in uh, the United Kingdom, one of the world's leading veterinary schools. One of the professors there developed um, this simulator for um, bovine rectal palpation. So um, one of the most important procedures for vets, particularly large animal vets, to be able to perform is pregnancy diagnosis in dairy cows. Dairy cows have to become pregnant at the, around about the same time every year in order to give birth to a calf in order to produce milk so that we can then take the milk from them. And if they don't get pregnant on time, it has major financial consequences for the farmer. So it's a really important issue. Are they getting pregnant? Are there any complications? Are there problems? So vets are often called in to check the state of pregnancy, see if there are any problems uh, going on. So they put their arm in the rectum and using a glove and they have a feel around to uh, actually feel the fetus and, and diagnose any abnormalities. So this is a little bit stressful if it's done repeatedly for cows and it can be a bit difficult to learn. What's going on here is that at the end of the fingertips is a sewing thimble that's connected to a robotic arm 
that is connected to a computer that's running a simulation. And you can program the uh, simulation to uh, simulate pregnancy at different stages or no pregnancy or pathologies and the student has to try to diagnose what it is that they're feeling inside that simulated cow. So this is haptic technology where uh, anatomically appropriate pressure is being applied to fingertips based on where they are inside the simulation. So Professor Bailey's developed this uh, haptic virtual cow. She's also done a horse model and she's also done uh, a cat. And with, with a cat, vets typically will feel the outside of the abdomen like that. Uh, when the cat is on a consult table, they're trying to feel inside the abdomen to see if there are any problems. <coughs> Those sorts of alternatives are naturally very expensive. What do you do if you're in a country, uh, in, a, in a developing nation and can't afford those kinds of things? In the Philippines, uh, local craftspeople were employed by a veterinary school there to develop these beautiful wooden carvings of a dog's head. And they're not soft and flexible and they can't do all the things that um, an advanced simulation can, but at least the students are still able to uh, practice uh, appropriate techniques for handling and restraint and practice how you would give a pill and do some simple procedures using alternatives like these as well. How do you learn veterinary surgery without practicing surgical procedures on healthy animals and then killing them? Well, veterinary surgery alternative surgical courses should ideally comprise three stages. In the first stage, students use things like knot tying boards, plastic organs, and simple models to learn manual skills such as instrument handling and how to uh, suture. They should then, having practiced all those, they should then progress to an ethically sourced cadaver and practice it on an actual cadaver. And the third stage, and by most important, by far the most important stage, is that students should actually start by observing a real surgery and then assisting on the close one-to-one -one supervision and performing the surgery on close one-to-one -one supervision similar to the training of, of human surgeons, of course. And these surgeries should be uh, on real patients that benefit from the procedures. One of the most popular um, ways that this is done is through animal shelter sterilisation programs. So homeless dogs and cats are sourced from animal shelters, brought to veterinary schools, um, or else on location in the shelter if they have an operating uh, theatre. The animals are sterilised. Uh, this stops them from uh, breeding afterwards and contributing to the pet overpopulation problem the shelter is trying to solve. It saves money for the shelter. It gives the students experience at the most common surgical procedures they'll need to know as new graduates. So everybody wins and they're extremely popular and usually are very successful programs being implemented in many veterinary schools around the world. This is an example of a simple surgical simulator. When I was a student doing surgery, I bought one of these. It cost 15 US dollars, very cheap. It's basically just a foam cylinder with several different layers and coloured threads running through to simulate blood vessels and some foam intestines in the middle. It stands for Dog Abdominal Surrogate for Instructional Exercises, DAISY. And you can rotate your cylinder and use it up to six times, which works out to around about $2.50 per, per um surgical simulation. So even though it's uh, really simple, I found it incredibly useful. Um, our surgical laboratories where we would anaesthetise healthy sheep, conduct surgical procedures on them and so on, would last from about three to six hours. They were pretty long and exhausting uh, laboratories. Using one of these still took me two to three hours because I had to start by um, <coughs> scrubbing myself in all the proper ways. Um, gloving, gowning, draping, masking, preparing my surgical field, all my instruments, that takes a while, all that stuff. You've got to practice all this stuff. And why, why practice all that on a real animal? You should be using a simulation to learn all these skills. So you prepare your surgical shield, you, you drape the animal, and then you have to blunt dissect your way through multiple tissue layers, encountering your red coloured threads. You clamp and ligate all of those as if they were blood vessels. You find your foam intestines, you exteriorise them, you bring them out. You wet them down with saline solutions so they don't dry out, they stay healthy. You cut out the diseased bit of intestine. You attach the remaining intestines together, conduct an anastomosis procedure. You have to carefully suture all the way around, pressure test it to make sure it doesn't leak, keep wetting it down so that it's not drying out, put it back in, start to close up all the layers carefully, 
finally finish. It takes a long time. There's a lot of skills uh, there. And it's almost, um, it's, it's just very inefficient to be uh, learning those for the first time on an animal. You should be learning all these skills on models, mannequins and simulators before progressing to an animal so that, um, for multiple reasons, so you can make better use of the animal. If it's anaesthetised, so the anaesthetic time is shorter, which saves a lot of money, is much safer for the animal as well. And so there's less chance of causing harm to the animal patient. There's no good reason not to be doing these kind of things. There are many other surgical simulators that have also been developed for uh, veterinary students and also for medical students. Um, down in the bottom left you can see a variety of bones uh, that have been developed um, by companies such as Sawbones. You can get standard bones, bones with um, various types of fractures, osteoporotic bones with increased fragility designed to simulate patients with osteoporosis and so on. Lots of simulations available. Um, people will uh, often argue that simulations don't bleed, so they're not sufficiently realistic. The one in the bottom left does bleed. This is called the Pulsating Organ Perfusion Simulator, the POP trainer, P-O-P. And what's going on here is it's basically just a big plastic tub with a major organ that's sourced either from an abattoir or hopefully from an ethically sourced cadaver and you connect the major blood vessels to a closed circuit containing uh, fake blood solution, maybe just water with a colourant, and also a pulsatile pump. So it pumps the fluid round in pulses. And if you are practising your surgical procedure and you cut one of the blood vessels, you will indeed get the spurting of blood, there will be bleeding, and you can practise your normal surgical skills which will be, you'll have to swab the area to remove enough blood so that you can see and you can find the bleeding location, clamp it, ligate it with suture material, stop the bleeding. You'll be able to practice all those skills with a simulation like this. You can practice both uh, conventional surgery and also minimally invasive surgery, which is where there's just two or three tiny holes with people remotely holding um, forceps, scalpels and a light and a camera coming in from uh, the, the hole up the top to do laparoscopic surgery. Um, on the top right, um, I'm behind the camera as a first year veterinary uh, student trying to stay upright and not pass out because this is the first time I've seen surgery and it's um, just after lunch and we're all exhausted because we're veterinary students. People would uh, pass out about once a semester. Watching the fourth year student, which is this guy, assist the surgeon with a spinal surgery on a dog. And of course this is the best kind of uh, alternative surgical training. It's, as I said, using real patients in beneficial procedures under close one-to-one -one supervision. The same way that human surgeons are trained to help the patients. You can find pictures like uh, videos like this on the internet. Um, this is a, a simulator where somebody is practicing laparoscopic surgical techniques. So uh, they would be controlling uh, these instruments up there, which would be uh, effectively forceps, scalpel, and uh, probably, as I say, a light going into a patient using a minimally invasive surgical approach. And they would see, um, in this case, there is no patient. There'll be a simulation on screen in front of them. There could be a patient on the bench behind them or a, even more frighteningly, on, on a table on the other side of the world, potentially. Maybe that's something for the future. Of course, you would certainly want to have your internet uh, connectivity uh, to be very reliable before you tried something like that. The point is that uh, simulations do exist for even these sorts of advanced surgical procedures and you can find them on the internet. Most veterinary schools don't have the money for anything like that. We certainly didn't. Um, this is an example of a real-world alternative sur surgical training program that didn't require any advanced technology like that. This is the one that uh, we set up. So myself and one other student went to our instructors and they said, you're forcing us to allow you to have an alternative, but we're not going to help you. Uh, you have to make up your own program. So what we did was we approached external veterinary clinics and we said can we come and get surgical experience and clinical experience with you and shadow you uh, and we were involved in a number of cases observing assisting performing surgery under close one-to-one -one supervision 
The surgical instructors also required us to source animals from somewhere, so we got them from animal shelters, bring them back to the university and conduct surgical procedures, in this case there were sterilisation operations, spays and castrations, to prove that we could do surgery to the university standards which were high. And we also had to attend all of the conventional surgical labs as well, as I said, as observers, which was useful because we could see um, the characteristics of the two. So we were getting one-to-one -one supervision, but in the conventional laboratories you'd have about six surgical groups of three students per group, and there would be two or three demonstrators in the room. So there was nothing like the same one-to-one -one supervision level uh, that we were getting in our alternative program. I also went and bought my own surgical DAISY uh, foam cylinder model because the university didn't have any. And we were also able to um, conduct some abdominal and orthopaedic surgeries on um, greyhounds that were being euthanised for medical reasons and donated for teaching purposes. And those animals, of course, were all deeply anaesthetised and then euthanised. So the outcomes of this program is that we missed out as being surgeon or assistant surgeon in at most 13 scheduled surgeries that occurred across a semester in the surgical program. But <laughs> we performed or assisted with at least 62 other surgeries, not counting the simulated surgeries I, I um, used the DAISY for. They performed under supervision, mostly in private practice. Now, the spay operation is the most important surgery for new graduates. This is the ovary hysterectomy, the sterilisation of, of the female dog or the cat. It's very, very common. Students will normally do this if they're in small animal dog and cat practice several times every week, probably several times a day quite often. But even though they're really common, they're major surgeries. You've got to go into the abdomen. There are really large blood vessels that have to be clamped and ligated and if you get anything wrong the animal can bleed to death. So it's very stressful and scary for new graduate veterinarians uh, unless they have a lot of experience. The norm in my veterinary school and most others was that students would get to do maybe half a spay operation, if they're lucky maybe one spay operation before they graduate and many students didn't get to do any. And you basically try to learn under supervision once you started your first job with the support of the other vets around you. So before we entered the final year of our course, we actually sterilised 45 dogs and cats, myself and one other student, including 21 spays. So we had this huge amount of experience that wasn't normal because we'd in, been involved in this alternative surgical program using sterilisations of animals in animal shelters. We also participated in a wide range of other surgeries as well, all sorts of things that you would see in regular small animal practice, which isn't normally what happens in veterinary schools because they're more specialist places. But we were out there in the community, in normal veterinary clinics, being involved in a wide range of real world sort of surgeries and anaesthetic experiences as well. So I, get, I got to see the differences, the experiences that we had compared to my classmates. I remember seeing one of my classmates shaking as she was trying to do her first cat castration. Cat castration is one of the simplest surgeries that exists and she was so you know, um, underconfident about this. So we had the benefits of having so much experience, we had so much more confidence and competence uh, at the surgeries which really helped us when we started in our first jobs as new graduate veterinarians. So I went mostly to London and practised uh, very successfully as a small animal vet for around about 10 years until I got recruited um, to go here. So this is the world's second largest veterinary school. This is uh, Ross University School of Veterinary Medicine in the Caribbean. And it's like a US satellite. 95% uh, of all the students are American, nearly all the faculty are American. And you can see it's on the edge of this volcano rising up on the right hand side and it's meant to be dormant but not really and we would occasionally sm smell whiffs of sulphur gas floating across the campus and we'd climb into the volcano and, and, and try and cook popcorn on the steam vents where the super hot steam would be coming out and do things like that. It was rough, I got put into this temporary accommodation when I first arrived there. I had to deal with traffic going back and forth past uh, my windows, it was quite busy. And I had unexpected visitors that would be knocking on my door sometimes. Um, 
So it was a, it was a hard time. This was the veterinary school. Um, this is the main uh, courtyard of the veterinary school. And this is one of the cafes where students and faculty would eat their lunch looking down at the Caribbean Sea. And if they were lucky, they would see sea turtles uh, popping up as well. I would see those every second time I went swimming. The students, unfortunately, didn't get to develop very good tans. In fact, they would get onto Facebook complaining uh, to their friends and family back home that they couldn't develop a tan because they spent all their time in the library or here. This was the clinical skills laboratory and I was brought to the veterinary school to become the director of this clinical skills laboratory. And it was a con converted cafeteria, actually. And as you can see, it had no view of the Caribbean, so they thought it wasn't as good as the other ones. Let's turn it into a clinical skills laboratory. So what we would do here is we would uh, instruct the students in surgical and clinical skills starting in semester one using a variety of models, mannequins and simulators, some of which were locally manufactured and very simple and very cheap to produce but were useful for teaching skills such as how to take blood samples from veins, uh, how to uh, suture um, simulations of the skin and so on. And we would start in semester one and build on those every semester of the program in a stepwise fashion, building more and more complex skills, starting to run simulations of medical cases on the trolleys. So by the time the students left the island at, after doing seven semesters and went to one of the mainland uh, veterinary schools to do their final clinical year, uh, they had a reputation of actually being particularly well developed in their uh, surgical and clinical skills uh, when they went to the other schools because we did this. And of course we didn't uh, harm any animals at all during that process. It was entirely using models, mannequins and simulators. Uh, with the gentleman that developed the laboratory in the first place, when it used to be a cafeteria, um, I published a paper on on how to set up a clinical skills laboratory. Um, these have been established in uh, many veterinary schools around the world now, but not all of them. For anyone that is, is interested in learning about uh, what you need to do, space requirements, staffing requirements, equipment requirements, what kind of skills you teach, when you teach them, uh, we published this paper to try to uh, help people uh, to establish these laboratories. I want to talk about some other papers that um, I published with um, Miriam, Dr. Miriam Zemanova and Susanna Laybeck. This actually is a more recent paper. We looked at um, educational animal use in uh, the European Union. Along the bottom you can see the total numbers during a, a recent five year period and you can see the numbers of animals in the European uh, area seem to vary from about 125 to about 170,000 animals being used each year and you can see the the top users at the bottom being Germany, France and the Netherlands and so on. It's been mentioned before that Bulgaria isn't one of the top users, but it does have the highest percentage of animals that are being used for scientific and educational purposes being used for education. And you can see the percentages there during three recent years. In 2019, more than half of all the animals were used for educational purposes here in Bulgaria. This is extremely unusual. During 2020 and 2019, it was the number one country. Uh, 2018, it was number two after Lithuania. So there's this clear trend for an unusually high proportion of animals that are being used for scientific purposes in this country, but used for education. This is bad news, but it's also really good news because uh, education is the easiest area to replace harmful animal use with because there is no argument that research is being done to develop any new knowledge. It's always to uh, demonstrate scientific principles that have been well established for many, many years, or to uh, practice surgical and training, uh, surgical and clinical skills for which there are well established alternatives as well. So it's particularly easy to replace this kind of animal use. Alternatives have been well developed. So maybe there's an opportunity here uh, to, to achieve more than would normally be possible on average in Bulgaria because of this. We looked at 249 non-technical summaries of educational animal use across EU member states to see what were the species and what were the um, kinds of procedures that animals were being used for. You can see most commonly uh, the animals were rodents and pigs um, and the most common procedures seem to be clinical skills training, uh, blood sampling, handling and so on, surgical training uh, and experiments in physiology. And 
we also looked at the reasons that were given in all of these summaries for using animals and, and not using um, alternatives. And the most common reasons were educators felt that practice on a living animal is necessary for proper learning and that there was no adequate model or alternative. So the next thing we did was we did a systematic review, which is where you systematically search the scientific literature for all relevant studies that are relevant to your research question. And what we wanted to look for was studies that had examined or had assessed students, had assessed the learning outcomes that were achieved using humane alternatives versus traditional harmful animal use. And it might be the acquisition of knowledge or it might be the development of clinical or surgical skills. And we found that there were 50 studies that have been published up to 2020. There will be more now. All the way back to 1968. And the studies in uh, yellow are those that demonstrated equivalent learning outcomes. And the studies in blue are those that demonstrated superior learning outcomes and most of the studies are in these groups. A small number were inferior for the humane teaching methods. You can see the disciplines that they were uh, fell under, um, uh, anatomy, physiology and surgical skills training for veterinary students were the top areas that uh, these studies had been uh, published in. You can see the humane methods that were most commonly used, computer simulations, models, uh, clay sculpting exercises, simulators, videos, and so on. Overall, the humane alternatives were producing learning outcomes that were superior 30% of the time and equivalent 60% of the time. So that's what the educational evidence tells us. Um, many times when these alternatives have been introduced by educators, they've done studies to see how the results compare to the previous method, and they've published the results. And that's what the 50 studies, probably more than 50, are telling us now. There are a wide range of skills that are uh, surgical skills that are assessed. Um, psychomotor, so that is hand-eye coordination skills, are assessed in all of these studies. Some of them assess skills in tying ligatures around blood vessels to prevent bleeding. Intestinal surgeries, closing up the abdomen, closing up the stomach, ovarian hysterectomies or spay operations full range of sort of common surgical techniques uh, that are assessed. There are non-surgical disciplines that are assessed in these studies as well. This example shows uh, that more efficient learning uh, of cardiovascular physiology occurred using interactive video discs. That's quite an old type of a simulation. More active learning with greater autonomy occurred using interactive databases containing images, movies and sounds in microbiology. Bovine rectal palpation was learnt more effectively using a haptic teaching tool, the one I showed you before. Equine nasogastric intubation, putting a tube down the nose of a horse into the stomach for um, inserting fluids, for example, or taking samples. This was learnt more effectively actually using a CD-ROM and students were more confident in how to do this procedure. Um, I also accidentally found 29 studies that did not involve comparisons between the two different groups in terms of learning outcome, but simply studied the humane teaching method and identified other advantages of the humane teaching methods. In one of my publications, uh, there is this table listing all of the 29 studies. But the common advantages were these. Humane teaching methods are usually associated with time and cost savings and also uh, increased uh, repeatability. Students can uh, practice a procedure again and again and focus in on different aspects that may be of uh, use to them. Obviously it saves uh, substantial numbers of lives, increases compliance with legislation and code of practice requiring alternatives to be used wherever possible. One thing people often forget is that the highly toxic chemicals that are often used to uh, preserve anatomy specimens also pose health hazards to people and it's important to comply with guidance to use gloves, gowns and, and masks when handling these anatomy specimens. Um, there have been actually surveys taken of the air in anatomy laboratories finding that the levels of chemicals in the air and on the, in the environment is often above recommended safe uh, limits. There is a potential for toxic um, adverse reactions of students actually in these environments as well. So that, that's, there's a potential liability issue there if um, safety uh, protocols are not fully complied with and unfortunately in the experience of myself and colleagues around the world that often is the case. 
decreased potential for conflict with students who are unwilling to harm animals in their education. That's an important issue as well. There are close to 6 million uh, vertebrate animals that are dis dissected annually in US high schools alone, according to one study. So there are very large numbers of animal lives who can be saved by using humane alternatives. These animals are supplied by companies that uh, breed them just for uh, these purposes or from Class B dealers who acquire them from a variety of other sources, including things like stray animals, free to good home ads and so on. Investigations have shown that unfortunately uh, inhumane killing practices and multiple violations of Animal Welfare Acts have been documented uh, in these companies where these animals are being killed and prepared for sale. And because of the sheer numbers of animals that are being used, there can be impacts on vulnerable frog populations because so often frogs are actually being used. Frogs are in decline in many parts of the world as well. There have been surveys done uh, also looking at the effects on students, uh, not just the animals now, but the students. Uh, in 1999, a colleague of mine surveyed um, 370 first-year veterinary students who had been killing more than 100 dogs, um, rats, um, pigs and rabbits each year in physiology. And the sorts of quotes that are coming from the student were these sorts of things. Difficult to get any great understanding of physiology because we're worried most of the time about not having our dog bleed to death or die of anaesthetic overdose. And that exactly matches the experience that we had uh, as, as students in my veterinary course as well. Most of us are too preoccupied with having to kill the dog that we weren't really concentrating on the physiology. Nothing was learnt in the labs. It couldn't have been learnt from a demo or a video. The guilt I felt for participating outweighed all the beneficial aspects. They talk about the stress of the experience, accidentally killing dogs um, with anaesthetic overdose because of the uh, lack of adequate supervision, really, which is something we saw as well. Overall, about 60% of students believe these labs were not worth the resources and only 20% felt they gained great benefit from their understanding of physiology. This survey caused these uh, laboratories to be stopped, along with media coverage of this story that happened at the same time. So these were stopped and replaced with humane alternatives. Exactly the same thing happened at Massey University a couple of years later. That's in New Zealand, New, uh, New Zealand's only veterinary school. We also need to be aware that there is a hidden curriculum um, endorsing harmful animal use. If you think about it within veterinary courses where alternatives are not being used, there's a lot of uh, um, usage of animals going on. There is a dissection of purpose-killed animals uh, in anatomy or animals from ethically debatable sources. There are demonstration experiments going on in physiology, biochemistry and pharmacology, animals usually killed during or after the experiment. And there are these terminal surgical procedures. So, the majority of veterinary students are re receiving little formal education in animal welfare issues or critical reasoning, but being directly required to harm and kill animals during their education. So the unspoken message is that harming and killing these healthy animals is not only condoned, but required to become a vet. And the animal welfare concerns are less important than human interests of debatable merit. This is giving negative underlying messages about the intrinsic value of animal lives. And also the stress, which is commonly described in these student surveys, is known to interfere with cognitive processes, the processing of information, memory and recall. So it's interfering with learning, actually. It's making learning less effective. This can result in desensitisation to suffering and killing over time and actually diminish capacity for compassion and ethical decision making. We know this because it's been documented in studies of veterinary students. Uh, specifically, uh, it's been found that veterinary students are less likely to view animals as sentient over the duration of the veterinary courses. Once they get to fourth year, they're less likely to provide appropriate perioperative pain relief compared to first year students because they view animals as being less sentient. And in other student groups in the university, over the course of a degree, there's evolution of something called moral reasoning ability, which is being blocked somehow in veterinary students. Doesn't happen in the veterinary students, but happens in all other groups. So all of these have been documented in uh, veterinary students. I think that these are actually psychological adaptations that are allowing veterinary students to cope with the extreme psychological stress 
are being required to harm and kill animals and they're coming in because they want to help animals but now they're being required to harm and kill animals in the absence of overwhelming necessity. So therefore, the use of humane teaching methods as well as so saving substantial numbers of animal lives directly is also likely to result in veterinary graduates with higher animal welfare standards which is going to more likely benefit their future patients. Such vets are more likely to become leaders rather than followers of evolving social standards on animal welfare as well. There have been some famous cases of conflict with students that didn't want to harm and kill animals in their education. Dr. Safia Rubai uh, sued her University of Colorado School of Medicine for $95,000 after they refused her request to be allowed to have an alternative to killing animals in a dog physiology laboratory. They failed her initially. She went to another US medical school that didn't require this, passed physiology, came back, got credit for that, and then graduated from the University of Colorado. In the same year, she then sued the university for costs, $95,000, and they were required by the court to establish humane alternatives. So that's one of the most famous examples. What happened 10 years later was instead of running both courses, they just dropped the harmful animal use completely. And that's usually the process that, that occurs. There's usually uh, these, these stages that they go through. There are now many uh, US states and indeed some other countries that have uh, laws that allow students to um, request alternatives. And I should also emphasize that the publicity for the university is never good when these sorts of conflicts with students come to light in the media. It was a major issue for my university when I was a student and a major factor in resulting in them very rapidly moving to bring in alternatives. So, in, to conclude, well-designed humane alternatives, clearly according to the evidence, normally perform at least as well as methods that rely upon harmful animal use. Sometimes they achieve superior learning outcomes as we've seen. Obviously, educators can best serve their students and animals and minimise costs and time requirements as well by introducing well-designed humane teaching methodologies. For people that would like uh, the published papers that I've mentioned, uh, advice for students on how to handle this issue at their universities, advice for universities on how to handle this issue, what kind of committees and policies and factors to consider, uh, as, long as, as, as well as libraries where you can find various alternatives, free online uh, computer simulations and so on. You can find them at my website, humanelearning.info and also the Interniche website as well. So thank you very much everybody. Um, that's it and I don't know if you want to ask any questions. <laughs>